We're going to be talking about respiratory system physiology, okay? mostly lung physiology. We're going to, of course, talk about the, the entire respiratory system, but we are going to focus on the lung function okay? to see how the, the respiratory system and the lungs participate together with the rest of the body okay? in maintaining homeostasis and making life possible. So we later understand what happens when there is disease associated to the lungs or to any part of the respiratory system. Okay, when you read the learning objectives, you are going to see there okay, many of the concepts that we are going to be explaining. Okay. Notice that we are going to go over again to the autonomic nervous system, integrating nervous system, endocrine system, okay, to the the function of the lung, okay, and we are going to go over the pulmonary circulation, cardiovascular system is going to be, it's going to appear also, okay, we are going to review again the hemoglobin, remember we started that in the last lecture, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, how it determines if the hemoglobin loads or unloads oxygen, depending on where it is. Okay, we are going to be going over the transport of carbon dioxide. And when we go to the carbon dioxide, we start studying the concept of pH regulation. Okay, it's uh, one of the main things that homeostasis tends to regulate, okay, the pH of the blood, trying to maintain it uh, between very, very narrow range. Okay, that's the perfect pH, the normal pH of the blood in which all the enzymes, all the proteins of the body, okay, work better. We make the blood more, al uh, more alkaline or more acidic. The proteins start changing the configuration. The uh, enzymes, for example, start working either faster or more slowly. And then we have a lot of complications as a result of this. So here we have the concepts that we are going to be learning. So when you study, please make sure you understand what they mean, okay, how they apply to physiology, okay, how they can be asked, uh, examples of uh, what happens if these things increase or decrease or there is any problem in the regulation of this. We are going to be talking about dead space, about shunt, alveolar ventilation, tidal volume, we're going to be looking at all these volumes and capacities of the lungs. Very important to understand uh, the lung function and also to diagnose diseases. And we do a differential diagnosis. And then we are going to see uh, the regulation of the ventilation, okay, what determines the respiratory rate, okay, why we sometimes breathe deeply or more shallowly or faster or more slowly. And we are going to see reflexes. Inflation reflex, deflation reflex, okay, different things that are important in the regulation of the lung function. What is that we have again here the concept of negative feedback. Remember the first day I told you we are going to be using the same concepts over and over again. Regulate the oxygen, CO2, hydrogen concentration, and then predict things that may happen. Okay, for example, the effect of exercise, okay the different forms or patterns of breathing, okay, what happens when we are in high altitude versus okay, low altitude. Many different things we are going to be exploring. Okay, it's very ambitious. Okay. It's what we want you to learn, little by little. Okay, if we don't get it now, we are going to have time in future lectures. So anatomically, the respiratory system is divided into parts, upper and lower respiratory tract, okay. Normally we use the larynx, the glottis, the glottic opening, okay, to divide the upper and lower. So anything, for example, diseases that affect throat, the nasal cavity, we call, it, we call them upper respiratory tract disorders or infection, okay. And then we have the lower tract, okay, it starts in the larynx, Okay, that is uh, it's known as the voice box. Actually, we don't need the larynx to speak. No, it's, well, the larynx, yes, but we don't need the vocal cords to speak. You can simply speak without using the vocal cords. When we speak like that, now if you want to 
develop a pitch lower or higher pitch, and you need to use the vocal cords. But it's more for the vocal cords are more for singing than for speaking, but they are useful. And larynx well, has this uh, very important cartilage, herpes glottis, okay, that opens and closes, protecting the airway when we're, we are swallowing. Okay, in mind that you have to design okay, a person or an animal. Okay, and there has to be a tract for breathing, for the air, and another for the food. Would you? Does it make sense for you to cross them somewhere? Okay. If we are designers, we normally will put a pipe for the air and another for the food, no? They shouldn't, you shouldn't mix this uh, pathway uh, at any moment. And if you notice the way this works, okay, you have here the food entering through the mouth, okay, and has to go through the esophagus, and there is an opening here for the air, okay, so the air enters through the nose, nasal cavity, and has to move anterior, okay, to reach the trachea while the foot enters through the mouth and moves posterior okay, to the esophagus, so they cross okay, in the pipes. Okay, so there can be many accidents okay, when we are swallowing and the food or the water or saliva may enter into the airway, okay, producing what we call aspiration. So there has to be a very, very good mechanism there preventing okay, that the food enters into the to the airway, okay? And mechanism depends on the functioning of many structures, cartilages, uh, ligaments, muscles, nerves. Okay, when we swallow, okay, that will produce the closure of this flap here, that is the epiglottis, which will be closed. They close the entry of the lower airway, so the foot goes to the esophagus. And also the soft palate has to be elevated. Okay, so the foot doesn't go to the nasal cavity. Okay. Sometimes it happens we are drinking something and we start laughing at the same time and you know what happens if the liquids, beer or milk, okay, may go to the nasal cavity and we have to laugh even more <laughs> as a result of that. So those are, uh, we're going to learn more about this in anatomy. Here we have the lower respiratory tract, where you have the trachea. Okay, then we remove all the big vessels. We are going to see the main bronchi. We are going to see the, okay, the, bron uh, the rest of the bronchi that start dividing okay, to different lobes and different parts of the lungs. You have there the lungs themselves. This is for you to have some anatomical guide, and you see the relationship between the arteries, veins, heart, lungs, etc. There is the diaphragm, okay, making like, for me, like a dome. Okay, if you look at the diaphragm, it starts very low here, and it makes like this dome shape. Okay, and when you study, for it, you do, for example, the diaphragmatic excursion in PD, you're simply looking at the descent of this diaphragm, and these fibers contract of these muscles gonna come down, going to push down the abdominal viscera, okay, expanding the lungs. And well, here we enter into the uh, viscerae part. Okay, there we have the functions of the lung. And we have divided them into respiratory and non-respiratory. I put lung there, but let's understand the uh, uh, respiratory system functions in general, lungs included. Okay, the respiratory part, the uh, most important thing is the movement of gases, air, between the atmosphere and the alveoli, so in and out, inhalation and exhalation. Okay, that gas ideally should have uh, 21% oxygen plus other gases. Okay, depending on where we are, at the sea level or at a high altitude, okay, those gases will have a greater or lower pressure. Okay, it's important to differentiate concentration and pressure. Okay, the concentration of oxygen is going to be the same, doesn't matter where you are, like sea level or at the top of the Everest. Now the atmospheric pressure is going to be 
higher when we are at the sea level than when we are in a high mountain. Or if we travel to a city, for example, Mexico or Bogota or any city that is in a high place, there's going to be a lower pressure because there are less, okay, fewer layers of air making pressure on us. Okay, and that is important because remember for gases to move from one place to another, okay, in the case of oxygen, they need to move from high pressure to low pressure, exactly as other stuff that we have studied before. Okay. And well, we have other functions there, the diffusion of oxygen from the air into the blood, diffusion of CO2 from the blood in or out to the alveoli to be eliminated. And we have some cells there that synthesize a substance that we call surfactant. Okay, it's almost like a detergent okay, that helps in the expansion of the lungs. Okay, and also has antimicrobial properties, destroying okay, bacteria, destroying many microorganisms that may enter there. And we have some of the non-respiratory functions. Okay, maintaining the acid base balance together with the kidneys. A very important immunity or defense uh, functions. Okay, we have macrophages in the alveoli. The, the immune function or the defense functions of the respiratory system start in the, in the nose. Okay, we have the hair that stop big particles, filter the air. Also we have the warming of the air, the, the moisturing of the air. Then when air enters into the trachea, into the bronchi, we have what we call the mucociliary scalator. Okay, the epithelia in the trachea bronchi, they are ciliated cells that are constantly moving okay, all the substances up. Okay, the mucus that is produced by the cells of the mucosa is going to be moved up, okay, to be normally swallowed, okay, and any bacteria, any debris, viruses, etc., that are trapped in that mucus. They are going to be destroyed by the acid of the stomach. Then we have endocrine functions. We have vascular function, the circulation, the pulmonary circulation, metabolic functions. Okay, we normally, when, when we think about metabolism, we always think in the, uh, the role of the liver as uh, one of the most important metabolic organs of the body. But the lungs also have a metabolic function. Okay, for example, uh, some medications that we take, uh, and some of the neurotransmitters that we produce, they are destroyed by the liver. For example, serotonin. Serotonin that is produced in the GI tract, when it reaches the, the lung, the lung destroys the serotonin. Okay, uh, other neurotransmitters are also eliminated there. For example, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is metabolized by the lung. Okay, these are things that are more important when you study uh, the pharmacology, the, what medications are metabolized by the lung, what medications are metabolized by the kidney or by the liver, that's important. And well, phonation, speaking. And when you study the systems, the body systems, okay, in anatomy, you study them in a form, okay, that is very specific, looking at tiny details, Apices, the bases, the three lobes, there are two lobes here, the bronchi, etc. Okay, when we look at the lungs from the physiology point of view, okay, we change the perspective completely. Okay, we try to see things. Uh, for example, we don't look at the lobes independently, okay, we or at the alveoli independently. We try to put all the things together like a big space, like we do with the intracellular and extracellular space. Then we do something similar, trying to understand how the lungs work okay, in the setting of this respiratory system and together with the rest of the body. Okay, and here we have the functional components of the respiratory system. Okay, for us to ventilate the lung, take air in, take the oxygen from the air and remove the CO2 from the blood and then send the uh, air with CO2 out, Okay, for all of this to work properly, we need several systems. One of them is called the pump system. There is, that there is a pump, like in the cardiovascular. We have a heart. There is a pump system that drives 
ventilation. Okay, remember ventilation is the movement of air. Okay, this pump system is uh, composed by the chest wall, by the pleura, okay, the respiratory muscles. We are going to be going in more detail later. Okay, and there are some other muscles that are called accessory muscles. Okay, we have sternocleidomastoids, scalenae, pectorals, latissimus dorsi. Okay, also we have the, the we are going to see the role of different muscles during inspiration and expiration. For example, if we are doing, we are in a very, we are very still, we are very relaxed at home, okay, doing nothing. Okay, our respiration or ventilation, okay, is going to be very shallow. Maybe we are going to move the diaphragm down just one centimeter or two centimeters. That doesn't require too much effort. Okay, in that case, only the diaphragm is going to participate. If we need to expand the chest more, then we need the external intercostal to help us expand the ribs. Okay, if we are going to do a deeper inspiration or someone who has shortness of breath, someone who is in respiratory distress, we are going to start using older muscles like the sternocleidomastoids, calinae. Okay, in the case of expiration, expiration typically when we are at rest is a process in which no muscle intervenes. Okay, we simply relax all the muscles and the chest wall simply recoils. Okay, due to the elastic properties. Okay, it's a passive process. Okay, now we need to do a forced expiration. Let's say we are running or we are walking very fast, we are exercising, then we need to eliminate okay, the excess CO2 that is accumulating. In that case, we have to use the abdominal muscles okay, to push the air out. We may use even the internal intercostals to compress the chest wall, squeeze the air out. So all that is the pump system. We are going to go over these details again. Then we have uh, the perfusion system, all the pulmonary circulation, the capillaries, arteries, veins, capillaries. We have a bronchial clearance system, part of the defense of the lungs. We mentioned before the mucociliary escalator, cilia moving, okay, the mucus okay, out of the lungs. Okay, and well, there also we can mention the cough reflex, sneezing reflex, okay, macrophages that are present in the mucosa. All these things have to be working together and so we can start understanding what is the importance of knowing this. For example, every time someone smokes, okay, or is exposed to tobacco, smoking, all the cilia get paralyzed. Okay, the movement of the cilia to eliminate the mucus stops, okay, because of the smoking. Okay, as a result of smoking, there is irritation. So the mucosa, the cells produce more mucus, but the cilia don't move. So that mucus, excess mucus that is produced stays there. And normally, because of gravity, goes down. Okay, so accumulates in the lower parts of the lungs and may get infected. Okay, and when we are sleeping, for example, imagine someone who smokes a lot and before going to bed, they smoke a couple of cigarettes. They go to sleep, so they spend hours producing mucus that is not taken out. So when they wake up in the morning, what normally happens is that they have a very intense cough, okay, they have a lot of expectoration, lots of sputum, okay, that's what we know as chronic bronchitis, that we are going to be studying uh, in part of the show. So those, that, uh, those are in the bronchi, then we have the alveolar clearance system, what happens at the level of the alveoli. There is another uh, sophisticated defense system. We have macrophages too. Okay, we have the lymphatic vessels. Okay, we have there some antibodies that are protecting these deeper areas. And we can mention there the, uh, the surfactant that we mentioned before. It's not there, but we have also the surfactant working at this level. And well, uh, we also have the gas exchange system, okay? Most important thing there. 
okay, there is a, a barrier that we have at the level of the alveoli that is composed of the alveolar cells and the capillaries, the, the endothelial cells of the capillaries that allows the exchange of gases. Okay, it has to be a very thin membrane to allow a very rapid exchange of oxygen and CO2. Okay, for this to work, of course, we need the air to reach the alveoli. So we require ventilation, we require that the blood is circulating inside the lungs, the perfusion of the capillaries, and also that there is a proper diffusion. Okay, so there shouldn't be anything in between okay, the alveolar cells and the capillaries, just a tiny bit of uh, fluid that normally is present there. If we have excess fluid, or if we have fibrosis, or if we have neutrophils, or pus, or anything, okay, that exchange of gases is not going to occur properly. So here we have divided the function by different parts, okay, uh, nasal cavity filters, large particles, worms, humidifies the air, has a role in phonation that our voice depends not only on our throat, also on our nasal cavity. Okay, when we have a cold, when we have flu or something, okay, nasal uh, obstruction, okay, our voice changes completely because the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses, okay, they are like resonance chambers for the voice. Okay, they will change the timbre of our voice. Okay, as if you have, a, for example, a guitar of different sizes, different shapes, it's going to sound differently because the guitar has a resonance chamber. Okay, if you change it, if you start putting, mind you take some t-shirts and you put them inside the, the, the box of, of the guitar. It's going to sound weird. The same thing happens when we have any sinusitis, okay, or any runny nose or anything. And the nasal cavity functions in smell, okay, in the upper part. You have the smell receptors and also in taste. Okay, it's not the same, uh, for example, the tongue. The tongue can only detect sweet, salt, sour, okay, umami, in okay, case specific uh, flavors. But how do we differentiate strawberry from coconut? Okay, how do you differentiate the strawberry ice cream from coconut ice cream? There is no taste receptor for coconut and strawberry and vanilla. Okay, there has to be a combination no, of sweet and smell. Okay, the essence, the vanilla, etc. That's why it's so bad when we eat. Okay, and we have a cold. Food doesn't taste. It's simply hot and salty. But that is true. It's chicken soup. It's hot and salty. This <laughs> is what we perceive. So here we have the larynx, okay? The larynx is not just for singing and screaming, okay? There are more functions for the larynx. Very important in sound generation, okay? Not necessary for speech, as we said before. Perfect. Perfectly speak without, okay? Using the, the vocal cords, but if you want to produce a pitch change, Soprano, mezzo soprano. No, that's going to be necessary to have a well trained vocal cords. Now, protection of the airway, an important function of the epiglottis. And for this, please remember using the medical terminology. Okay. Uh, in physiology, we don't make many questions about anatomy, but Professor Santos does. And sometimes, using the medical terminology, you have everything. Okay, you need to know. Okay, the glottis is simply the opening between the vocal cords. The glottis is actually not nothing. It's a space, like the pupil. The, is, is that a pupil? No, pupil doesn't exist. It's simply the opening okay, inside the iris. Okay, the glottis is the opening in between the vocal cords. Now, what protects it? The epi, glottis. Epi means above, open, Okay, so there is an, an epiglottic space and a subglottic space below the glottis. And, well, 
there we have some important, uh, one of the important functions of the larynx, okay, for us, clinically speaking. Okay, we are not gonna be speech uh, uh, pathologists, okay, maybe, but no, but right now we are not getting trained for that. One of the most important functions of the larynx and the vocal cords is the generation of what we call a positive and expiratory pressure. Maybe sound like Japanese now, but we are gonna be getting this little by little. What happens when we inhale? Just in mind what is happening in your lungs when you inhale. The chest is expanding, okay? The diaphragm is going down, the ribs are opening up, okay? That increases the volume of the chest cavity, okay? That increased volume reduces the pressure inside the chest, and that draws air into the chest, okay? When that air is going down, the vocal cords, okay, are gonna be opening, okay, to let the air in. So notice that they abduct, vocal cords abduct. We have a greater diameter in the glottis. Notice how we are using the same principles that we studied in cardiovascular, greater diameter, re that reduces the resistance to air flow, exactly when, as when we were talking about blood vessels and blood. Now, what happens during exhalation? During exhalation, there is a slight adduction of the vocal cords. So we are gonna close a little bit the vocal cords. We're gonna reduce the diameter while the air goes out. Okay, that is gonna increase the resistance to the air that moves out, okay? And that generates what we call a positive and expiratory pressure. So try to think what that means uh, from the medical terminology point of view. In the respiratory cycle, we have inhalation and expiration. So this is a pressure that occurs at the end of the expiration, a positive pressure, that has a very important physiological function, okay, that, uh, for example, will maintain, but when we exhale, that the lungs are going to the initial uh, position. They are getting compressed by the, by the chest wall. That positive pressure at the end of the expiration is gonna help to keep the alveoli open so they don't collapse. Okay, just imagine the alveoli are very, very tiny sacs of cells that contain surfactant, like a detergent and some water if we let them close like this, then it's gonna be very hard to open them up. So at the end of expiration, okay, that positive pressure, okay, keeps the alveoli open so they don't collapse. Okay, this is also important for speech. Okay, that is the pressure of air that we generate against the vocal cords when we are in, during the exhalation for speaking, for singing. For the cough, it's important to, before cough, what happens? We, how cough works? We take air, we close the glottis, and then we forcefully, okay, send the air out by suddenly opening the glottis. So that is a very important positive and expiratory pressure. Okay, and this is also important to maintain what we call, we're gonna see what that means later, a functional residual capacity. Okay, keep in mind that term, functional residual capacity, FRC. That is simply telling us what is the amount of air okay, that we have inside the lungs after a normal expiration. Okay, we are simply sitting down, very relaxed. We breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, okay? I'm not talking about the forceful expiration. Simply breathe in, breathe out. The air that is in the lungs when we are at rest, that is called the functional residual capacity. Okay, then you can, for example, do a maximal expiration. You can, you can get rid of part of that air that is inside, okay, but that is called a forceful or a forced expiration. 
So this positive and expiratory pressure is very important for all that. Speaking, coughing, uh, avoiding the respiratory or the alveolar collapse, maintaining a forced, uh, sorry, a functional residual capacity. Now, what happens if someone has a vocal cord paralysis? Let's say someone has a stroke and they have a vocal cord paralysis, then they are not going to be able to generate a good positive and expiratory pressure. That's why they have difficulty with speech, cough, okay, all these things. And for example, when we intubate a patient, when we intubate a patient, we're putting a tube and we're displacing the vocal cord. There is no way you can abduct or adapt anything if there is a tube in between. So the patient is going to be unable to generate a positive end expiratory pressure. That's why, for example, uh, they may develop what we call intellectasis, which is simply the collapse of parts of the lung. Okay, mostly if we are, for example, lying on the left side, for example, the areas of the lungs on the left side that are not expanding, okay, they may collapse. We are on the right side, these parts are going to collapse. If we are lying down uh, in the supine position, the areas in the back of the lungs may collapse because these ribs are simply not moving. Okay? Normally, when we have a patient intubate the artificial ventilation, we tend to apply a small positive end expiratory pressure. Okay? That is around the physiological one. It's a bit more, which sometimes can be dangerous. Okay? Remember during COVID, Okay, maybe you heard, well, if they have to be intubated, probably they are going to get complications and they are more likely to die than if they don't. So we try to avoid intubating patients. Because that can produce rupture of the lung tissue that, is, that has inflammation. Also increasing this, or producing this pressure inside the lungs will produce obstruction to the circulation that is trying to reach the lung from the head, from the rest of the body. Okay, if you increase the pressure in the lung at the end of expiration, you are creating resistance to the blood flow. Okay, so that may produce, for example, the elevated intracranial pressure, may elevate the, the risk of rupture of the lung, etc. risk of bleeding. Um, intubated patients, at least in ICU, they were prone them. Is that the reason for the proning? Yeah, there is a, in, in the case of COVID, there is a, a reason, and it's the, if you are like this, if you look at the lungs, say this is a person okay, in the head, you look at the trunk here, the lung is like this, okay? When you auscultate the patient from the front, you have access to the upper lobes, not to the lower lobes. If you want to auscultate the lower lobes, you have to go to the back. Here you have the scapula. So you, what you are auscultating actually is the lower lobes. And you auscultate from the back. If the patient is lying prone, the tube is here. This, this area is not moving. They are moving. Okay, the back is on top of the bed. So these ribs are not expanding because of the pressure of the bed. Now, if you put the patient, this is the bed now, now they can expand all this. There's more area. Okay? That's the, the main reason for that. They yeah. can move the ribs. Open, close, open, close. So there is more ventilation that they can perform, have more area to ventilate. You have less uh, amount of atelectasis or, colla or collapse lungs. And, well, let's take a look at this before going to the break. Um, physiologically, uh, it's very important for us to divide the lung into what we call conducting zone and respiratory zone. Okay, so, what is that? When you study anatomy, you study this. For anatomists, this part here is very important. This goes this, this goes there, this goes that, this receives this innervation, this has more cartilage, less cartilage, blah, 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 blah. 
For anatomy, the airways are divided in two parts. The conducting zone, that is from the nasal cavity, pharynx, and trachea, bronchi, notice that the conducting zone reaches what we call the terminal, bron terminal bronchioles. Okay, there are many divisions. Okay, divisions, subdivisions, 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 until we reach the bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. Then we have the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs. For physiologists, that is only one space, respiratory zone. Okay, we divide the lung into two areas, one in which there is no gas exchange, and the other in which there is gas exchange. Okay, this area with no gas exchange is something that we call dead space. Okay, dead space. Also known as anatomical dead space. Okay, because normally there is no gas exchange there. The gas exchange starts here, in the respiratory bronchioles, ducts, and sacs. Now, what is also important from the physiology point of view? The bronchioles and the terminal bronchioles, even though there is no gas exchange, they are very important in the regulation of the amount of air that enters down here. Because there is no cartilage around them, so the smooth muscle, Okay, when we say someone has a bronchoconstriction, we are talking about actually bronchioloconstriction. Okay, closing, opening, closing, opening, so air goes there, here, here, there. Okay, now you probably have heard about the anatomical versus physiological dead space. And it's important to know what that means. What I represent here, hello. We are going to divide the lung in three. Okay, the base, the middle, and the apex. Okay? And we are going to represent here the conducting zone. That is, all those pipes from the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, etc. Okay? All this area in which there is no gas exchange at all is called the anatomical dead space. Now, when we are at rest, we are watching TV, something that is not exciting, a boring something, so nothing happens. Draw the heart here, the pulmonary artery. Okay, blood goes from the heart to the lung. Notice how easy it is for the blood to enter here. And do what? Goes up or down? What would you do if you were the, the blood, if you, if you reach this area? Go up or down? Down. Oh. What is the pathway of least resistance? What do you prefer to escalate? Simply go down by inertia, gravity. Normally the blood goes down. Okay? So at rest, all the blood that goes out from the, uh, from the lung, from the heart, is five liters per minute. From the right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation, five liters per minute will go up to here. Okay? There is going to be almost no blood in the upper part, in the apices. Okay, simply because it's not necessary. We have five liters of blood per minute. That enter there, by gravity go down. So if you look at the blood vessels they, they, in the base and in the middle part of the lung, they are gonna be like this. And in the apices, they're gonna be collapsed. Because of gravity and also because of when we inhale, almost all the air is going to go up. Not too much is going to go down. Okay? Imagine the, the lungs, the, the, the lung tissue. Okay? Imagine that you have a lung with all of these alveoli. 
and you are holding the lungs from the apices. Okay? The alveoli in the upper part, they are going to be very open, and the alveoli in the lower part, they are not going to be that open. So this very open alveoli on top are going to like compress the blood vessels. So we are going to have almost no blood circulation in the apices at rest. And we don't need it. Okay, the apices of the lungs are like a reservoir for when we are exercising. When we start exercising, the cardiac output goes from five per minute, five liters per minute, let's say, to 10 liters per minute. That huge amount of blood that enters the lung during exercise has to be accommodated somewhere. Okay, and during exercise, we open up the circulation in the apices. So we can accommodate now the 10 liters. Of course, we dilate the pulmonary, the, the blood vessels in the bases, in the middle part, and also open, recruit the apices. And we can accommodate up to 20 liters per minute during external, during very, very intense exercise. Okay? So when we are at rest, we have this area here that is not doing any kind of gas exchange. That is what we call the physiological dead space. Physio dead space. It's physiological, it's not anatomical. You can play with it, you can change it, can take more, take less. It's like you have, if you have a room that is a room for everything. Okay, now I, this is gonna be for watching movies. But next month, there is someone visiting me from Spain. So I, I will make a guest room. Then I don't want guests, I will make a storage room. Then a laundry room. This is something that can be used for many purposes. So, that is the dead space, physiological dead space, the apices. When we are exercising, the dead space, imagine you start walking, goes from here to here. If we start running, it goes from here to here. If we start doing very, very intense exercise, the dead space is zero. We are using the entire lung. So, what happens to the physiological dead space? Increase the lung capacity when you're at What happens to the, one point, what happens to the physiological dead space when we exercise, increases or decreases? Increases. Decreases. decreases. I hope you don't answer your Okay, like previous uh, editions of the books. Okay? Apices, as we increase the exercise level, we go from five liters per minute to six to seven to eight to 10 to 20. We need more blood vessels to accommodate that blood that is coming from the heart. So the physiological dead space is reduced. As the cardiac output increases, the physiological dead space decreases during exercise. Okay, that's good. So the, the physiological dead space is in the the pulmonary artery? Is that an arrow? In the oh no, it's the after? apex. Oh. Okay, okay. it's all this part here. I thought okay. it was pointing That to is the, the heart. anatomical dead space that well, you can change that if you remove a lung now. But normally, physiologically, it doesn't change. Physiological dead space change. And now let's have a break. Okay, let's have 10 minutes. It is 11.02. So, at 11.12. This one? What is yours? All the area where you don't have any gas exchange. All this? All the conductors are so the anatomical displacement. <laughs> 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 
catastrophic processes. This is the chemical that This is just for me to understand, like, if you were to have, like, if the negative feedback loop is broken for some of the reasons you can see, then you can have low cortisol and high circulation. That's how the acid that's just a more simple. Fever you have. No problem. The lack of the bacteria is going to lead to an that are extremely hard, okay? Some people study this concept for years and don't get it, okay? It's impossible to understand them while listening to someone talk, okay? When you study, 
organize your studies by, okay, I'm going to study according to the learning objectives, the concepts of ventilation, respiration, and some other concepts. Okay, so you start there. What are the lung functions? Okay, well, we have the ventilation, that is the movement of gases between, in and out of the lungs, inspiration, expiration. Then when the air gets there, what happens? Oxygen goes to the blood, CO2 goes from the blood to the air. That is respiration or gas exchange. Okay, then other functions. So when you start studying these concepts, after you learn the other ones, ventilation, gas exchange, etc., then you have the anatomical divisions that Professor Santos will deal with that, and the physiological divisions. That is the conducting zone from trachea all the way down to the terminal bronchioles, the ones that we have smooth muscle to open and close. Asthma, you want to open them. Albuterol opens them. Parasympathetic closes them, sympathetic opens them, parasympathetic closes them. But we don't have any gas exchange there. Okay, so we don't use the oxygen there, that is there. And then we have the respiratory zone. Respiratory, what is respiration? And you study for the prereqs, and you study before. Well, uh, external respiration, internal respiration. What is external respiration? The exchange of gases between the alveoli and the uh, pulmonary capillaries. What is internal respiration? The exchange of gases between the systemic capillaries and the tissues. So respiration occurs here in the respiratory zone. In the entire zone, well, it depends okay, if we are exercising or not. Okay, the conducting zone, all this area in which we never have gas exchange, is called the anatomical dead space. Anatomical things normally don't change unless there is disease or you cut them or you open them or you burn them. Physiological things can be adapted to the needs of the body. Physiologically, we have at the rest a cardiac output of five liters per minute. Okay. During exercise, you can have 20 liters per minute. The heart chambers and valves don't change during exercise. Anatomically speaking, the heart is the same. Four chambers, valves, arteries, veins, coronary, right, left. So anatomical, anatomical structures don't change okay, when we are exercising. Okay, they may become wider, etc. It's something more physiological. Now, the diagram, you see if this works better, is representing the conducting zone, all the anatomical dead space that is there with the air going in and out, ventilation, inhalation, exhalation. And then at the level of the lung in the alveoli, the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, ducts and sacs, we have gas exchange. At the rest, only here. At the rest, we don't use the upper part of the lung. Well, maybe if we are upside down, we are gonna use the upper and not the, the base. No? But normally we are not walking on our hands or upside down. Okay. I can say that in public, but <laughs> so this is the physiological dead space. Dead space doesn't mean that it's wasted or that is uh, that is dead actually. It's simply that we don't have gas exchange there. At rest. Okay, if we start exercising, we are gonna recruit blood vessels, they are collapsed normally at rest. Okay, so if you auscultate the person when they are totally at rest and you don't tell them, every time you feel my stethoscope, take a deep breath through the mouth. Silence. Silence, total silence. You may hear the <coughs> sound from the lower bubble, very distant. That's why we have to tell them. Take a deep breath every time you, because you need to recruit more alveoli because there's almost no movement of air in the upper parts. They are totally open all the time because they are like hanging from the pleura, right? open. And well, during exercise, we are gonna start using everything that says reserved for workout times 
So during exercise, we have a reduction in the dead space because we need those, we need to open those blood vessels to start exchanging gases there. And that's the reason why even if you are at rest or you are 20 minutes running in a treadmill, when you look at the arterial blood gases, the oxygen saturation, the pressure of oxygen is going to be the same. It doesn't matter that the blood is circulating now faster. If we oxygenate the entire blood, because we recruit more areas for gas exchange and eliminate CO2, we maintain a normal arterial pH during exercise. Okay, the only difference during exercise and the rest is the venous part of the blood. If you compare the pH of the blood at the rest and exercise is the same. If you compare the pH of the blood at the rest and during exercise, during ex exercise is very acidic and has very low oxygen and very high amount of CO2. <coughs> That's the only difference. But since we recruit the lungs, we adapt all the circulation in the pulmonary circulation, that we have okay, the possibility of maintaining a saturation of oxygen and a pressure of oxygen okay, that is very, very, very similar to the one at rest. Of course, in healthy people. Okay, when we are not very healthy, that is not the same. So here we have a in more in detail, those physiological divisions, or this that one here. Okay, and you can see, for example, all the conducting zone, okay, the respiratory zone. The blood reaches the respiratory zone, deoxygenated, and gets oxygen. So notice the change in color representing that. And what we are adding here is the amount of air, okay, that enters and stays normally during inspiration okay, and expiration in each of these zones. Okay, after the, the taking a, a, after inhalation, doesn't matter how deep you breathe, okay, or there is you are drawing blood from the air from outside, you're feeling all the respiratory zone. There is always gonna be some air here, right? Logical. That air normally is 150 milliliters. Okay, that is what normally stays in the anatomical dead space or conducting zone. Okay, we are talking about an average male that weighs 70 kilograms. Okay, this, this is not taking into account variations in kids, it's gonna be a lot less, in very tall people, it's gonna be larger than that. But average, 150 milliliters. Okay, in the respiratory zone, okay, all the alveolar spaces, notice that we have 300 million alveoli, that if you extend them, they are gonna be form a surface of 70 square meter. Compare with the skin, that the skin is around two meters square. Okay, if you take all your skin, it's two square meter, if you take all your alveoli, it's 70, okay? And if you extend the small intestine epithelium completely, it's like 300 square meters. By the amount of surface that we have for absorption of food, oxygen, and skin, compared to the skin. So the amount of air that normally fits in the respiratory zone is around three liters, 3,000 uh, milliliters. That's gonna be very important when we start uh, going deeper into this, okay? Because imagine that, uh, let's say we are breathing normally, okay? Uh, the normal tidal volume, the normal amount of air that goes in and out of the lung during a normal respiration, that we call tidal respiration, is 500 milliliters. Okay, of those 500 milliliters, 150 are gonna stay here and 350 are gonna go to the respiratory zone. So normally at rest, we only get into the respiratory zone 350 milliliters of air. We don't need more. That gives us enough oxygen for doing nothing at home. When we are exercising, we need to take more air. So instead of 500, okay, we are gonna get 1,000, 1,000 and more air. Okay, depending on how deep we are breathing. But what happens if we have anxiety, if we are, have a panic attack? 
<laughs> this brick. With less air, but more frequently. We are taking maybe 200 milliliters of air in and out. 200. That means 150 are here, and we are getting only 50. There. 50. There. 50. There. Okay. And that could be a problem. Okay, so to start understanding what are, the, what are the implications of this when we talk about disease, about different signs, symptoms. Professor, would that be hyperventilation? Um, That's shallow breathing. Shallow breathing. Paper bag? In, in hyperventilation, normally, the, the term ventilation means amount of air going in and out. Okay, if you have a hyperventilation, you have more air in and out. That is what produces the, the respiratory alkalosis, the tingling and sensations, etc. But shallow breathing, like you are scared of not breathing very deep and very fast, it's just like, brisk, like freezing, or overdose, opiates overdose, and depresses the respiratory center. Now remember when we were talking about uh, blood flow, blood flow velocity, and we were mentioning the differences in the diameter of the arteries, veins, okay, and what and the meaning of the cross-sectional area in the, in the circulatory system. Something similar happens in the airway. Okay, remember we are studying circulation, but now air instead of blood. Okay. And we are gonna see the relationship between air flow now, instead of blood flow, air flow and resistance, and what is the speed or velocity of the air flow, okay, in relationship to the diameter of the bronchi or bronchioles, and also in relationship to the cross-sectional area of the section of the lung that we are studying. Here we have a graph. It's important to learn how to read and interpret graphs, okay? You have a graph there that has on the y-axis, the vertical axis, the total cross-sectional area, okay? And on the x-axis, horizontal, you have the airway generation. What is that? Well, if you go back to the table, okay, that shows the anatomical and physiological uh, details, you have generation 0 to 16, that means divisions. First generation is a trachea. Okay, this generation zero is a trachea, one main bronchi, then two, three, four, five. Okay, from the trachea to the terminal bronchioles, the anatomical dead space. Okay, and then the rest from the 17 to the 23 are the respiratory zone. So having that in mind, notice the difference, okay, in the cross-sectional area depending on the airway generation, starting from the trachea, on the conducting zone, and then the respiratory zone. What is a huge? Okay, if you compare the diameter of the trachea, the two main bronchi together, the rest of the bronchi, depending on their generation together, with the cross-sectional area of the alveoli, okay, at the end, the, the last generation of the uh, uh, alveoli that we said before, okay, is 70 square meter. Okay, we are gonna understand the same relationship that we studied for the blood now with the air. Okay, at the beginning, okay, depending on the diameter, the smaller the diameter, there's gonna be certain resistance to the airflow. Okay, these generations of bronchi are gonna be decreasing, the individual diameters is gonna be decreasing by the cross-sectional area is larger. So there is less resistance, and less, and less, and less resistance. Okay? And what happens when, with the velocity? Okay, the smaller the diameter, the faster the velocity has to be. Okay, to move all that air that is going in. But once you have a wider and wider and wider cross-sectional area, larger cross-sectional area, the velocity is gonna be very, very, very slow. Okay, and this is something that is very similar to what happens with the blood. The blood circulates very fast in the arteries, then very slow in the capillaries, and then starts circulating again faster in the veins. 
So when the air goes okay, into the first airways, it's going to travel fast. Okay, then slower, 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 until it reaches the end. It's going to travel more slowly. Because there, remember, we need to exchange gases. There has to be like a little pause. Okay, both are going to pause a little bit. The air and the blood, mm -hmm. gas exchange, and then they separate. Pause, it's like the music. Okay, you can have a good music without at least a little pause for, oh. no, my music is notes, 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 notes with a little pause to breathe, okay? So more or less the same concepts, but now with air. And it's gonna be a little bit different because, of course, there are obvious differences between the circulation of the blood, I mean, this loop, okay? Arteries, veins, lungs, arteries, veins, lungs, heart, arteries, veins, lungs, heart, and the air in the lungs that goes in and out through the same tube. Okay, we don't have a, a, a trachea for the oxygenated air and a, another trachea for the deoxygenated. We don't have that. Okay, it's a bit different. So we're going to uh, study in more detail how what we call the respiratory pump works. Okay, we are going to study in more details the role of the different muscles. Okay, you have there the, the left side the muscles that participate in inspiration, and on the right side, the process of expiration. Okay, the most important muscle for the inspiration is the diaphragm, as we said before. Okay, and then we have the accessory muscles, sternocleidomastoids, calines, okay, and pectoralis also participate external intercostals. Now, what is this external Okay, intercostals. Expand the chest. External expand. So if you expand the chest, we are going to have inspiration. And let me tell you something that happened to me some many years ago. Because every time I study this stuff, I have to, okay, I need to make sure that I don't have to study this again. I, I'm studying and creating the mnemonics at the same time. We have the area of mnemonic creation there, and I remember studying, okay, external expansion, if you expand, the air enters. When I was in the exam, my brain betrayed me. <laughs> my brain told me, external, exhalation. <laughs> and I was totally sure that I was fine. So make sure you don't make the same mistake. External expansion, external. Okay. Now, what about expiration or exhalation? What is that for quiet breathing, no muscle issues? Okay, simply the recoil of the chest wall. When we expand the chest, then the ribs are going to fall down. Okay. We simply need to relax the diaphragm, relax all the muscles that produce the inspiration, and the chest will recoil if we are happy. If we are not very healthy, you're gonna stay like that, like a paper bag. You know, if you know someone with emphysema, for example, you're gonna see that they have what we call a barrel chest, hyperinflated lungs. That's the way they. That's why they have an increased respiratory rate. Because my, you have to. There's no way you can exchange gases with that little amount of air. And then when we have a forced expiration, more active breathing, for example, during exercise, okay, we can use the accessory muscles of expiration, the internal intercostals that pull the ribs inwards, internals inwards, externals outwards, expansion. Then we have the abdominal muscles that will push the abdominal viscera and they will push the diaphragm up, okay, to take the air out. The abdominal muscles in, in general. And this is the representation of the lung for a physiologist. Okay. We are going to start exploring some more concepts that are important in physiology to understand how all this works. 
That is how we represent the law. Okay, we have here this triangle that is representing the chest wall. Okay, then we have below in, in, in the top, in the bottom part, we have the diaphragm forming like a dome. And then we have like a tube that is representing the conducting airway and this round thing that is representing the alveoli or, or the respiratory zone. Now imagine that you have an actual uh, a PVC tube. This is a PVC tube, and this is a container that is hermetically closed. Okay, and you put a balloon, a real balloon, attached there to that PVC tube. How can you inflate that balloon? Imagine someone tells you you have to inflate the balloon, but you can't use your mouth, you can't use any device on top here. Because it would be very easy to inflate the balloon simply by blowing air there. But if we can't use the mouth, we can't push air through this opening, then we have to do something from below, okay? And let's say that this here is made of latex, it's a sheet of latex, okay? And as I told you, this is hermetically closed, it's tightly sealed. So the only thing we can do is take this latex and pull it down. Okay, if we put the latex down, we are gonna create a negative pressure inside this that is gonna inflate the balloon. Okay, when you do that, air will enter and the balloon will get inflated. And when we release that latex, the balloon will collapse. And that's more or less how the, the lungs work. Okay, if you look at that diagram, uh, you have the chest wall, the diaphragm, alveoli, the conducting zone. Okay, all these areas, shadowed area in the middle, okay, there between the, the respiratory conducting and chest wall is the pleural space. Okay, the pleural, pleural space is tightly sealed, contains some small amount of fluid, and normally has always a negative pressure compared to the air. Okay, that is like four, okay, three, four, five centimeters of water, of water negative compared to the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so if the atmospheric pressure at the sea level is 760, okay, the pressure in the plural space is gonna be 756. Okay, why that happens? For the following reason. This is the chest wall, this is the plural, and this is, these are the lungs, okay? Normally, the chest wall is like pulling outwards, when there are like, like springs pulling outwards in that direction, and the pleura, on the, the, the tissue of the lung, is like a spring that is pulling this inwards. It's like trying to separate the two, okay? Separating, the, there are two springs trying to put apart Okay, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. So that creates a negative pressure within the pleural space. Okay, and that is what keeps the alveoli open. Okay, if you, let's say the pressure, uh, the atmospheric pressure is zero. Okay, and the pressure in the pleural space is minus five. That minus five is what keeps this open. For that reason, if I open a hole here, now the, the pressure here, instead of minus five, is gonna be zero, the same of the atmospheric pressure. Since we are not gonna have any difference in pressure here and here. That will pass. Okay? So, the question is, what keeps the alveoli open when we are at rest? Okay? In the, we are not moving the, 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 the chest wall. The difference in pressure between the plural space and the pressure here. That is exactly the same that here. Because this is open. Okay? The pressure inside the alveoli, when we are not breathing, remember, when we are not breathing at the end of the normal tidal expiration, 
we are at what we call the functional residual capacity. In that moment, the pressure inside the alveoli is exactly the same as the atmospheric pressure. And the pressure in the alveolar, in the plural space is that pressure minus four, or minus five. That difference between the pressure in the alveoli and the pressure in the plural space is what keeps the airway of the alveoli open, prevent them from collapsing. Okay? Again, if there is a wound, puncture wound here, now we lose the seal. Now the pressure here becomes the same as here and the same as here. So that balloon is going to collapse. Okay, and then we have to understand what happens during inspiration, during expiration. Professor, yes. you said the difference was 4 to 6? 46? No, 4 to 6. What was the range of atmosphere and plural? Oh, normally uh, my, uh, around minus 4, minus 5. Minus now, notice what is happening here. The respiration is a cycle. Okay? We have a study in cardio, the cardiac cycle. Systole, diastole. Systole, diastole. Here we have a cycle. Inspiration, expiration. Inspiration, expiration. Okay? How we produce that? This is exactly the same diagram we saw before. Pressure here is negative compared to this pressure. Plural pressure negative compared to alveolar pressure. Pressure in the alveoli is the same as atmospheric pressure. Notice that at the rest, the alveolar pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. That's why air doesn't move. Air is standing there. Now, what happens during inspiration? Notice what is happening here. That fragment goes down. I'm expanding the chest. I am pulling from the latex shape. The balloon is going to inflate. Why? Because now the pressure in the plural space, instead of minus 5, compared to the atmospheric, goes to minus 8. More negative. Like that. Suction pressure. And that will inflate the balloon. Now the balloon is expanding. If you expand something, the pressure inside that something drops. So when you do that expansion of the chest, the pressure in the alveoli goes below the atmospheric pressure. And that draws air from outside. Okay? We make a more negative pleural pressure. The alveolar pressure goes below the atmospheric pressure, drawing air into the alveoli. Then what happens during expiration? We relax the diaphragm. Diaphragm, diaphragm goes up, and you relax it. So now, the pressure inside the plural space that was minus 8 is going to go up to minus 5. And it's going to squeeze the balloon, the respiratory zone, the alveoli, making the pressure now in the alveoli greater than the atmospheric pressure. So the air goes up. Many concept there. Okay, we already asked what determines that these alveoli don't collapse or that they stay open at the negative pressure in the plural space. Now, what determines if the air goes in or out, the direction of the airflow? The difference between what and what? The alveolar pressure and the atmospheric pressure. The difference between atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure determines the direction of the airflow. And it's the same principle, from high to low. Who's pushing, who's stronger? The one who's stronger is going to push harder. But when you have a greater atmospheric pressure, air goes in. When you have a greater alveolar pressure, air goes out. Now, what determines the size of the lung? The ribcage. There's only help so far that I can expand. I know the ribcage has to do with that. Pressures. Physiology. What determines that the lungs, the 
chest wall and the alveoli expand or not? The difference between what pressure and what pressure? Pleural and alveolar pressure. Okay? The pressure that we have here, and the pressure that we have here, remember it's normally at rest minus 5. If I make the intrapleural pressure drop to minus 8, I'm increasing the difference. So the alveoli will follow. If I relax the diaphragm, I'm going to go from minus 8 to minus 5 again. So the lungs are going to collapse. Expand, collapse. Expand, collapse. Collapse, but not expand. Go back to, to resting. Recoil. Let's say recoil. That pressure, the difference between the intrapleural pressure and the alveolar pressure is called the transpulmonary pressure. The greater the difference, the more spot. Transpulmonary pressure, or TPB, transpulmonary pressure. An important concept for questions. What determines if the air goes out? What determines that the air goes in? In which of the following situations inhalation will be favored? In which of the following situations expiration will occur? Which of the following will lead to long expansion? Which of the following will favor long recoil? Or decreasing long volume or increasing long volume? It's exactly the same. And um, that air going in and out can be measured using different mechanisms. There are very simple mechanisms that we have at the, at in, in the medical offices. Spiro spirometry, you can use a device and measure the air. Take the patient, okay, take a deep breath and then exhale as fast as possible or simply measure the amount of air that the patients take. And if you want to measure other uh, stuff here, Okay, you have to use more sophisticated tests because there are things that we can't do at the, at the office. Okay, in the office I have a patient, I can tell, okay, you're going to take a deep breath and then blow the air out and I will have something, okay, registering the amount of air that went in and out, in and out. Normal, deep inspiration, deep expiration, forced expiration. But in an office, how many medicine or pulmonology regular office, you can't know how much air is left in the lungs after a maximal expiration. Okay? You don't know that. It's impossible. That's something, if you want to measure that, you have to do other sophisticated tests okay, with the other uh, stuff, with markers, etc. And here we have a representation of these things that we can measure. Okay, notice that we have some values on the left side that we call volumes. Volume, 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 volume. And on the right side, in the middle and on the right side, we have capacities. Okay, the difference is volumes are individual values and capacities are okay, the, what we obtain when we add up two or more volumes okay, of these volumes. Okay, you can start uh, wherever you like. Okay, and um, I prefer to start in the normal respiration. This yellow thing here, the tidal volume, tides. You're looking at the. Uh, you are at, at the ocean. A very peaceful day. Some tides there. Mm -hmm. Boring, no. Okay, this is the amount of air that we normally get in and out in a normal inspiration, expiration. Okay. And this is what the patients get when they have a deep breath. They fill their lungs, okay? So everything that is above the normal inspiration, of course there is a limit, okay? And the limit is given by a reflex. That is called the inflation reflex. There is a moment when we decide to take a deep breath, our lungs are gonna inflate, we are gonna try to inflate them as much as possible. 
that will stretch the pleura, will stretch the alveoli, and there is a moment when there is going to be a signal to the respiratory center that is going to say, say stop. And it doesn't matter how hard we try, we can continue because we want to protect the lung. Okay. That is called the heading brewer reflex. Heading brewer, let me write it there. I'm not totally sure about the spelling now. I didn't study German very well. Heading, I think, I'm not sure about this N. Heading brewer. Something like that. I'm not sure if, if it's heading or heading. It's two hours. Eh? Two hours. Oh no, actually one. This week or without? I'm sorry. Heading or heading? Yeah, heading. Heading. With N? Heading brewer, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you spell it right. It's better called a lung inflation reflex. Protect the lungs against overinflation. Now, when you tell the patient, take a deep breath every time you feel the stethoscope, they are doing this, mm, mm, going here, mm, 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 mm. Okay, notice that is the inspiratory capacity. Okay, inspiratory capacity is the sum of the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume. Then sometimes you need to do other tests, okay? And you are gonna tell the patients, take a deep breath and then breathe out as hard, as fast as possible until your lungs are empty. Get rid of all the air. So they are gonna get here. Something we call the expiratory reserve volume. Everything below the tidal volume. Everything below the tidal expiration. Notice that if we add these three, we are gonna obtain the vital capacity. That you can assess normally. Okay, take a deep breath and then breathe out everything that you can get rid of. Or tell the patient as fast as possible. They have to actually do an effort. In that case, we call it the forced vital capacity, or FVC. Very important for the future. Forced vital capacity. Now, all the things that we have mentioned, tidal volume, inspiratory, expiratory reserve volume, inspiratory capacity, vital capacity, are the only things that we measure in the office. The rest can't be measured in an office. Because for, for us to measure the rest of the stuff here, we need to know how much air is left in the lungs. Okay? And we don't know that. For example, to measure the functional residual capacity, you need that. To measure the total lung capacity, you need that. So, do you mind the question? Which of the following can you, or you can't measure during or using a normal spirometry device or the office, etc.? Because it's, from here you can make many questions. But for example, if I want you to calculate, I, I give you the values of the, some values of the pulmonary function tests. And I want you to calculate the total lung capacity, I have to give you this. Or I can give you, patient has a vital capacity and a total lung capacity of, that's the residual volume, that's the case. Because you have one of the values that contain the residual volume, simply, you want to know this is this less this, minus this. No, you get this. That's more or less how these things can appear in exam, yeah? And is there some sort of device or equipment in hospitals and things like that that can measure residual volume? Research, research, mm -hmm. research. Research? Okay. They need to add markers okay, to the air, that is inspired air, and then measure the amount that is left to measure the, the residual. You can estimate, for example, in a patient with uh, emphysema, okay, that have air trapped in the lungs, you can estimate Okay, depending on the other values, you can estimate, depending on the size of the, of the chest wall and the value that you have, you can estimate the other one, but normally the accurate measure is, is at the research level, okay, so special tests. Okay, there you have video, okay, that you can use to explore this in more detail. 
and that's going to be everything for today. Okay. Thank you. We move tomorrow to perfusion and gas exchange. Sure. On the last slide, with the inspiratory capacity and functional residual capacity, like, what, what would you really test with this? Like, how would you know what you want to do? Now, officially, simply, home session, we have calculated each brain and the other. I'm going to be very important to follow the solution. Different types of drugs versus restrictive drugs versus that's the last thing I heard. Okay. Right now I have the same information that you